This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Good afternoon, and welcome to the lunch show on Teachers Talk Radio. My name is Samuel Lickis, and I'm so excited to be hosting my debut show. On this show, we will be discussing all aspects of the PGCE and initial teacher training. If you're starting your PGCE this year, or you're interested in going into teaching, then this is the show for you. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. This afternoon, I am joined by Daisy Turner. Daisy is a head of science at a British international school and she's a really experienced PGC and ECT, that's early career teacher, mentor. Daisy, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Um, thank you for joining me. Um, hopefully you can talk. Um, how's the start of term been for you so far? Um, do the term dates more or less align with those in the UK where you are? Just connecting. <laughs> Hi, Daisy, can you hear me? I think your microphone is muted. So anyway, my name is Samuel Lickis. Um, my, my background's been all, all a bit odd because um, I'm actually doing my PGC this year. I had my first inset day at my new school yesterday, which was really, really good. Um, but this is actually the second time I've been starting off the September time of the PGC because um, I actually started at this time last year. And for various reasons, I took a suspension from the course in January. And in that, in the meantime, between January and now, I've been um, working as a teacher, humanities and a bit of maths at an SEMH, that's Social, Emotional and Mental Health Specialist School, which I really, really enjoyed. And I'm really excited to be coming back to, um, I'm really excited to be coming back to the PGCE course with all of its challenges and thrills and everything that's ahead. Um, and I'm so sort of really keen to be um, and excited to be doing this show because it means it gives me an opportunity to talk to people who know a lot about what it means to be a really good teacher, but also mentoring um, new students, uh, student teachers, um, and ECTs, those early career teachers, um, and, and sort of trying to gain as much advice as I possibly can and, and share that with other people who are learning to be um, and training to be teachers, um, hopefully, hopefully being the best that we can possibly be. Um, Daisy, have you been able to connect properly now? Yeah, I think I'm here now. I'm really sorry. Uh, I'm going to blame the <laughs> no problem Wi-Fi for that situation. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, I, I used to um, work out in South India. Um, so I taught at an international school out there, um, geography. And um, yeah, the internet there was flaky at best. You could never rely on sort of streaming YouTube and lessons or anything like that. Yeah, it's normally really good here. It's sometimes when I just first connect to something, it just goes a bit, um, it goes a bit funny. But I do think, I think we're all okay now. Brilliant. Have, have you come back to school already? Uh, no, so we go back to school tomorrow, um, but we've got a whole week of inset, so students don't come back until the 7th, because Saudi runs on a Sunday to Thursday week. Um, okay. So yeah, we don't. St our students don't come back until the 7th, so we've got a full week of inset, um, which is why I was super on board with doing this, with doing the show with you today, because part of my role in this inset week is getting our um, ECTs, and we actually have one, one teacher doing their PGCA. Um, and getting them all set up oh. and ready to go. So yeah. yes, busy, busy time for you. It's really nice that you've got that week of inset days. Um, yeah, you know, the beginning that you can sort of all get settled in and oriented with the new school and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Have you um, done? Do you do any sort of unusual things in your inset day? Because I know yesterday for our inset day it was a bit unexpected. They had a um, so they have these icebreakers and sort of team building things, don't they? And we had this mini D of E exercise, they called it. So we went out into town with maps and had to do uh, find different things. And they asked me what I was doing my PGCE and I said geography and all of a sudden it was my responsibility to do the, the map reading. 
um no we don't we don't have too much um so on thursday which is our friday um we will um we'll have like a little staff sort of sports game um out on the astro turf but no to be honest though you know it's 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 47 degrees here at the moment in the daytime so it's very much all inside and um, there's a couple of icebreakers. There's a lot of staff C- staff led CPD. Um, I'm running two different CPDs, um, and there's I think there's at least one person from each of the departments doing CPD. So it's but we also unlike the UK, we have a huge amount of department time. So um, every day there's at least two hours that we spend either as a department or on our own, just getting ourselves ready for that first week back. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking to you more about this in just a moment. So we're going to take a quick break and um, for our news bulletin. So we'll be back with you shortly. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. A wide range of media outlets have covered the ongoing issue of reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete, or RAC, and its use in buildings, including schools, leading to concerns around safety. The BBC reports that buildings at 52 schools in England were at risk of sudden collapse due to dangerous concrete. While safety measures have since been put in place at these schools, because the situation was deemed critical, more than 100 others have also now been told to close areas with the concrete. These buildings were previously thought to be at less risk. The new guidance follows the collapse of a beam that was thought to be safe. Head teachers are now making alternative plans just days before the start of the new academic year. Some pupils have been told they will be learning remotely, whilst others are being housed in temporary classrooms or even at other schools. The total number of confirmed schools affected in England is 156. The news has since triggered concerns in all three of the home nations. The Scottish Government said it was trying to establish how many schools contain RAC, whilst in Wales investigations continue, although there have been no reports at present. The Northern Ireland DV said schools were being checked as a matter of urgency. Ministers in England have been facing media and having struggled to keep up with a range of questions being asked, including how fixing the issues caused by RAC will be paid for. Opposition MPs have pointed out that schools themselves already have issues with funding, and that local authorities have seen cuts in recent years, so finances may not be there at a local level. The DfE has also faced criticism for not publishing a list of schools affected, although it defended its actions, saying parents should hear direct from the school itself, at least at first. A school in South End, which caters for pupils with physical and learning difficulties, has contacted the BBC to outline the significant challenges it is facing as the closure of its main building means staff and pupils cannot access essential special equipment. Whatever the outcome, it is certain that, for some pupils, this is the start of yet another unusual school year. Away from issues with buildings, Schools Week reports on plans to ensure all schools in England hold electronic registers which the Education Secretary will have direct access to. However, proposals to introduce thresholds at which penalty notices must be considered for unauthorised absences are paused. They were part of the currently shelved New Schools Bill. New rules are not expected to come into force until 2024, but it has been made clear that ministers see attendance as an area which must improve. More than half of parents who responded to the consultation on the plans for e-registers disagreed due to the possible punitive use of the data collected. 
officials said it would be used to enable better early intervention. 92% of local authority workers and 85% of school staff who responded support the plan. The DfE will move forward with changes to simplify recording of attendance or absence. In total, 22.3% of pupils missed more than one in 10 sessions in the 2022 to 2023 academic year. This is compared to 22.5% in the year 21 to 22, despite significant government intervention. Prior to the pandemic, these rates sat between 10 and 13%. The TES reports that a group of watchdogs, including Ofsted, are jointly to carry out targeted inspections in schools where there is a risk of pupils being exposed to serious violence or exploitation. The inspections will happen in six unnamed local authorities and examine how police, social services and health services tackle serious youth violence. The focus will be on multi-agency interventions and could include interventions in schools, parks, shopping centres or specific streets where young people may be at risk. The team will include representatives from Ofsted, the Care Quality Commission, HMI of Constabulary, HMI of Probation Services, and each team will be led by an Ofsted Health and Social Care Inspector. Where a school is involved, they will be asked to show they have effective systems to identify children at risk of or subject to serious youth violence and children who are missing from school. The inspections will end in May next year. Full details of the report can be found on TES online. Finally, The Guardian reports that Lego is to begin selling bricks coded with Braille to help blind and partially sighted children learn to read the touch-based alphabet. The Danish makers of the bricks have made specialist versions tested and developed by blind organisations across the globe. The bricks have been sent to a selection of schools free of charge since 2020, but now they will be available more widely. LEGO hopes the initiative will help parents, siblings and others share in learning Braille and to encourage play interactions between sighted children and visually impaired friends. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. Welcome back, everyone. It's, um, I think... When you're starting off a new year and a new at a new school, there's there's just so much you have to take in. Because I remember just just yesterday when we had the inset day at my new school, we had our department meeting and I got to meet all the other geography teachers, which was really good. And um, but there was this whole there was this sort of experience where uh, the head of department was talking through um, their their IT systems, and it's a school that's really big on its technology, which has not been my experience before. Um, where there's sort of lots of iPads and laptops and all sorts of apps and things that I've never used before. I have to admit, it was quite overwhelming, and I was sort of frantically taking notes and all these sorts of things and, and sort of trying to remember um, the file hierarchy on the computer and which files are needed where and which documents, what have you. And I just thought, I just realised that, that I was never going to remember this because there was just so much information to take in on one day. So I was wondering, Daisy, like when you're starting a new school as a student teacher, what should your top priorities be? What's the important things to remember and sort of take away from your first few days there? And what, what can be delayed until sort of a little bit later? So I think um, you wouldn't be alone in, in struggling with the whole file system. I think that every school obviously does it differently and that can be so confusing. Um, for me, I think the top, I mean, top three things, uh, safeguarding procedure, uh, who is your designated safeguarding lead? What do you do? Um, what is the policy within the department in terms of, um, you know, if you need to go and report something immediately, what's the procedure on sort of that? Um, for me specifically, it's in science, but I think as a general thing, what's the health and safety and first aid procedure? You know, who is who are you contacting? What are their numbers or how do you contact them? Um, and then any sort of mandatory reporting, so any sort of registers and um, making sure that, you know, as in a day, you're not going to be falling short of any mandatory procedure that needs to be met. Anything else can be learned as you go. Like anything else can be learned as you go, like files and things like that. But um, in terms of um, anything that is legally mandatory needs to be. Um, but that isn't necessarily on the student. And um, that should be on whoever is inducting you into that to make sure that you know 
exactly what it is you're supposed to be doing if you're taking over because i know some pgcs are different so some student teachers don't teach straight away mm. um and others do uh, if you are teaching straight away then the behavior policy is a big one uh, what do you, you know what are the sanctions what's the procedure that you need to follow how do you um you know how do you go about doing that because i often i've seen this before and it's and it's not it's not good when it undermines that student teacher if they then have to turn to the more senior teacher in the room mm. and say oh what am i doing now you know how what, what like looking at them like what do i do you know that should be um that should be a sort of first uh, basic sort of thing but i think it, it is hugely overwhelming and um, there's far too much information to take in all at once um and i think you know we need to be realistic about it like you know i've been teaching quite a long time now and and um even I sometimes now I'm like, where's that? How do I find that? Like, <laughs> I know, I know tomorrow I'll have, I won't be able to log into the printer. I already know this. My first job tomorrow is to go down to IT because I can't remember my printer code. Um, so, <laughs> yes, you know, passwords it, it, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's passwords. It, it's it's everything. So I think that as long as as long as you're comfortable on the mandatory um, procedures, you know, registers, safeguarding, health and safety, and science is a big one. But you know, just in, just first aid in general. As long as as long as you know what you're doing with that, um, and you can keep your kids safe, then everything else will come in time. And um, that would be my most important thing, I think. No, that's really good advice. You're just talking about safeguarding first and foremost, and uh, first aid, um, behaviour policy as well. You know, so I think safeguarding is a really sort of key one. Um, it, it's um, it's one of those terms that is, is used an awful lot in education. And I think a lot of people aren't necessarily 100% sure what it means. Um, so you know, and what it involves, what the teacher's responsibility, and especially a sort of student teacher, what their responsibility safeguarding is. So I don't suppose you could just give us a, a brief outline of that. Yeah, sure. I mean, you want to start to learn this off by heart because they're going to ask you in every single interview you ever go into. Uh, one of the mandatory questions in an interview is what do you do? Uh, in relation to safeguarding. So safeguarding is um, ensuring the safety and well-being of all the learners in, in your care. So um, if, you know, it's mandatory reporting, if you notice something, so the student doesn't even have to bring it to you directly, but um, if you notice something or you overhear something or or something is even just off slightly, teachers grow this incredible intuition, which will mm -hmm. come with time. But um so yeah, you need to report that to your designated safeguarding lead. Um, in the in the case of um, PGCE students, it's um, it's often uh, deemed to be acceptable to go and run it by your PGCE mentor first, um, in, in case you're not sure, unless uh, that has been a direct disclosure. So if a child has made a direct disclosure to you, uh, then you need to go straight to your designated safeguarding lead and you need to report that. One of the things that we do find um, with uh, student teachers is sometimes that they wait um, schools are very very chaotic places and mm. um, things things can get especially if you're not accustomed to that kind of chaos and um, it can feel very sort of overwhelming but when we say directly to safeguarding we mean that so that would mean getting somebody to cover your class and you go right then and there and report it and um, you know whether or not you've written that down ideally you would have but if you haven't it's okay you need to go and verbally report that to your designated safeguard and lead it's not an email it's not an it's you know if it's been a direct disclosure you need to go straight away and um, but so when we when i'm talking about that being the most effective thing i mean most important thing when you first start is you need to know who that person is and um, that should be they should be introduced to you in like day one or two basically of the year and um, you'll have safeguarding training with the whole staff usually um, but you need you need to know who that person is, know how to find them. Um, and if you are shadowing like one member of staff, maybe or or whoever your PGCE could be your subject mentor, for example, um, they can support you in that as well in terms of covering your class. Because obviously you shouldn't be alone um, in your classes in, in mm. uh, at least for, for a significant chunk of time. So um, they will cover your class while you go and report that. Um, but it does need to be done immediately. Yeah, thank you. That's really useful because it. I, I'm, in schools I've worked in before, we've always had whole school training and safeguarding, and it's always been one of our uh, sessions as part of uh, sort of our training sessions as well at university. And so it is something. It's it's definitely yeah. It's it's something that's really important to get your head around. Um, and I just remember when I first started, there were just lots and lots of different so, so many acronyms, aren't there, in education about 
you know, you've got the designated safeguarding lead and you've got the deputy designated safeguarding lead yeah, and it's, various it's, different organisations run by the council or um, yeah, you know, those things, yeah. I do, th- I do think, as you say, it is information overload a little bit um, with PGC students. And I do think that new schools need to make sure that they uh, keep it to the bare bones of what you need to know. Like you don't, like student teachers do not need to know the, you know, who YPCS, CAMS, you know, they don't need to know that, that, that those people in the first few weeks, all they need to know is who are they reporting to um, and and how is that report to be given, basically. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think a lot, I think most people would agree it's the front, it's the number one responsibility of the teacher in the room is safeguarding, is to make sure that every child in there is safe um, and that their well-being is being considered. So, um, yeah, it's it's a really really important thing, and as I say, you'll get asked on every single interview, um, and the answer is always, um, it's all it's always the same. Uh, you report directly to your designated safeguard, and uh, and there's a few rules around uh, how to speak to students, but like I say, you'll be given that in training. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, just just yeah, fundamentals first of all, and then just sort of build it up as as time goes on. Yeah, that's really useful. Thank you. Um, you sort of mentioned health and safety, particularly in a sort of science setting, and I. Um, I don't know if it's sort of maybe the right person to ask, but I imagine sort of primary school um, teachers as well might have a particular sort of focus on health and safety when you've got students. You know, we had that case a few um, a little while ago. It was um, someone had been using the glue gun and they got a little burn <laughs> yeah. on themselves and you know, that sort of thing. And and I, I feel like certainly for me, you can sort of start to become a little bit paranoid about this sort of thing about students getting injured while you've got a duty of care to them. You know whether it's whether it's in the science lab or doing field work in geography, or if you're in primary doing some sort of arts and crafts or something like that. Yeah, you know, is, there, is there a sort of sensible balance to strike, or how, how do you judge what is appropriate? Sort of yeah, ab- absolutely. Speak. So, so, um, so I was actually on a I was on another teacher talk uh, session about about this not that long ago. Um, you cannot account for everything. Um, you 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 simply can't mitigate every possible scenario. Um, the story I told on, on that was I took some students to a zoo um, and a child got attacked by butterflies in the butterfly house. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> the, the, the Chester zookeeper had never seen it. Um, they just swamped him. I don't know if it was some sort of soap he had on, but he was just covered in head to toe in butterflies and the kid was freaking out and he had like a little panic attack and stuff. I, I can't write a risk assessment for butterflies. You know, <laughs> that's not, it, it's just, it's just unreasonable. So it's all about, you know, reasonable and appropriate precautions. It's, it risk assessment writing if you're doing any form of practical activity or any sort of activity where there is risk involved that's an important skill and um, if you're not within the science department then um, your own department probably has them but if they don't you know go and speak to science because we are dab hands at writing uh, risk assessments um and it's basically just you know like i say it's mitigating it's reasonable and responsive precaution it's things that are likely to happen that are likely to cause damage um, I would say to any student teacher as well, if you are going to do field work or practical work, you need to practice it with somebody else first. Um, mm. You know, so I always get my my student teachers to practice with me and um, pretend I'm the student, run me through it, um, what you're going to do. Um, and then, you know, if everything goes well, if everything's fine, then we can, we then that, that's great. And, and, I'm, and I'm happy for them to do it. If not, we can tweak it a little bit. We can give them a bit more training on this or that. And, and, the key thing is that you're confident. So, you know, with geography field work, for example, geography is a massive subject. So uh, rivers, for example, might not be your speciality at university. It might not be something that you've ever really spent a huge amount of time since you were in school doing. Um, so, you know, any idea you've got, run it past uh, your PGC, men- your subject mentor, or run it past under the member of staff and 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 work alongside them and, and get their support with it. Um, my general rule is if you're not confident in doing it yourself you absolutely shouldn't be teaching it and um, and i do think that sometimes student teachers are put under a huge amount of pressure to make their lessons um, glittery as i call them but you mm. know all bells and whistles and jazz hands and things like that and that can sometimes push them into doing stuff that they're maybe not 100 percent confident in doing themselves and um, and that's a no-no uh, don't, don't do anything that you're not absolutely confident in doing and um, within science that's things like dissections and stuff you know if 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 you're not 100% confident in that, uh, don't do it. Practice it with another member of staff until you are, and then do it then. Mm, oh, that's really good advice. And, you know, you sort of mentioned about making lessons glittery because there is a lot of pressure on um, student teachers to 
do really well and teach lessons that are really engaging that the students enjoy and get a lot out of and you know I have that pressure to think oh every lesson needs to be a sort of piece of theatre doesn't it and uh, all sorts of um amazing special effects or whatever going on in the lesson but you know that does put a lot of pressure as you say on teachers and I think I think we've all been in a lesson before perhaps when we were at school ourselves where a science experiment just just hasn't worked and it's all a sort of a damp squid isn't it uh squib yeah I mean, love that. And it's, I mean uh, yeah yeah I, I tell my students all the time if it doesn't work I'm like welcome to real world science because it very rarely works um, you know, it's it's <laughs> that is what it is. Like it's um, a lot of science is stuff not working, and that gives you as much information as when it does work. But um, yeah, I, I, it's it's a bit of a bugbear of mine to be honest. Um, I I think that student teachers should be supported in producing well rounded, robust, bulletproof, you know, learning opportunities, not bells and whistles, lollipop sticks out of a cup throwing a ball around for questions it's just not and the problem is once you finish your PGC you then go and start your uh, ECT or NQT year uh, and you realize how unsustainable that actually is um, mm. so and, it, and like, like I say it pushes it pushes an already very stressful situation because make no mistake the PGC is one of the most stressful things you'll ever do um, but it pushes it into into stratospheric stress levels because you're mm. now trying to individually plan you know bells and whistle lessons that are that are like you say pieces of theater and that's just not realistic for teaching it's just it just isn't um and it's also how we end up with mistakes being made and timings not working out and students messing around and potential health and safety concerns and it's because there's just too much going on at once um so i think that it's really important to just you know that whole that like little phrase like keep it simple stupid it's like that yeah you know keep it nice and simple stick to your pedag pedagogical rules that you know work um stick to things that are tried and tested great teaching methods and go with that um because you know it, it can be um it can be attractive to to want to sort of make these mad lessons that take you hours to prepare and hours to then to, to sort out but you know, if you want to really build the fundamentals of teaching, then that that isn't it. <laughs> mm. And that's not that's not what your most of your lessons are going to be like. No, I think it's really really good points. And you mentioned the word robust there, and you also said sustainable. And I think that sort of segues into a, a an important question because you did say that the PGC is going to be one of the most stressful years um, that you probably ever do. Because I mean, I I've, I started it again, started it last year, this time last year, and I sort of had had that experience for the first term and. Um, it is stressful. It's a lot of work. You're effectively studying full time while also working full time. And I so just suppose I have to sort of ask, in terms of sustainability, how do you how do you manage that time? Uh, you know, making sure you've got good energy going into lessons. You you've you've actually got a social life outside of school and your studies as well. You know, you've got that um, that's really important of your well being. How do, how do you manage and balance all that out? Yeah, so I think that um, I think that the answer to that is, is twofold. Um, one, I think we have to be very careful with student teachers about telling them that this isn't a job; it's a vocation and it's a calling and all the rest of it. And it and it's 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 a job. <laughs> it's a job. Mm. You get paid for a set number of hours in a day, and it is a job. Um, but the PGCE is quite unique in the fact that, as you say, you are a full time student. So you're writing essays for uni and everything else while also then trying to be a teacher and i think that my my strongest piece of advice would be to get a get a routine in place get a system going and i taught this to all of the pgc students that, that I've, I've looked after um in my time but uh, mornings are your friend not afternoons so and mm. um, obviously this does if you're really not a morning person then this might not work but um mornings are your friend so you know, get into school nice and early and you've got an hour in the morning then with the printer where there's not a queue. Uh, you can actually get hold of a computer. You, it's quiet. You're not being pestered by students 24 seven. Um, so, you know, take it, take an hour in the morning to maybe get in, even if you can just get in 40 minutes early, an hour early um, and get it done. Because by the end of the day, you are, I, I don't know about everyone else, but I am, I, I'm brain zapped by the end of the day. By the end of the day, I've got nothing left to give, really. I can mm. tidy up my room. I can maybe do some printing, but the real planning, 
that I need to think about. My, my brain's mush by the end of the day. Um, so the morning would so get, get a really good routine going. Um, don't be afraid to tell them that you're struggling. Uh, don't be afraid to tell them that something is too much or there is just too much going on maybe or, you know, things like that. And don't be mm. afraid to tell your PGC mentor that nice and early when it starts to build up a little bit. Um, and it, it is all about being, working smarter, not harder. Um, you know, try, when, when you have got multiple, multiple classes on the go, try and get it so that they're not clashing with marking and things like that. Try and get yourself into a nice routine where, um, you know, every week there's one class to be marked or something along those lines. You know, it's all about organization and keeping yourself, you know, really organized. Um, because a lot of the students that I've seen who have struggled, it has been for, or yeah, I'd say a lot of them who, who, who have found it more difficult, maybe just haven't organized themselves quite as well as they should have done. Um, they're relying on the afternoon to get stuff done. And the reason that doesn't work very well in a school is because jobs build up throughout the day. So by the mm. time you get to half past three, four o'clock, not only have you got all the stuff that you started the day with having to do, you've now got all of that, all of today's tasks as well. So the best, like, like I say, if I really could give any advice, it's get an hour in in the morning, get your today jobs done. And then you can, if you want to stay an hour after school or an hour when you get home to do the jobs that arose today, you haven't got the whole thing to sort of deal with all at once. Um, making use of time in school. You can tell those bored teachers in the staff room to leave you alone and tell them that you're busy, put your earphones in, ignore them. Um, because there are a lot of teachers in schools. I love them but um, they'll eat your PPA up and <laughs> they'll come and chat. They'll, they'll, they'll come and chat to you because they're bored or because they don't want to go and do the work that they're supposed to be doing. Um, myself included, we've all done it. Um, you just but, love a nap, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we, yeah. You know, we, we just love a chat. Something mad might've happened on the yard at break and they all want to talk about it or, but they'll eat your time. And, and those hours in school can be really productive if you, you know, if you can facilitate it. And um, if it does become a problem, you know, with a staff room, again, speak to your subject mentor, your PGC mentor and see if there's somewhere else you can work. Um, if it is becoming a problem, because I've done that in the past, like I gave up my office uh, to my PGCE uh, student because our staff room was wild. There was just people in there all the time and she just couldn't get anything done. So, you know, carve that space for yourself. You know, this is your learning opportunity. This is your future career. You know, so take take that authority in yourself and be like, no, this isn't working. I need somewhere else to work. Um, and like I say, just teachers are you know you'll have seen it all over teacher twitter where we love the summer holidays but there's a huge proportion of teachers who are a bit at a loss because we're we're routine creatures we like mm. a start time a break time a lunch time we you know we are and so if you can get that instilled in yourself from quite an early time in the pgce you will find it easier than that kind of sitting in bed at nine o'clock with your laptop out that's you know it's not productive and um or remembering last minute to do things and and things like that. So I think that, like I say, being organised is is number one really in terms of managing it. And it's you know take that authority in your own in your own learning. And if something is if mm. something is too much, if a teacher you know because they always try and push the club onto the uh, PGCE student and stuff, and um, they always want the PGCE student to do run a club or do this or you know tick this off the standards. You know if it's too much, you, you know you need to have a bit of faith in yourself to say that's too much because. Um, you know, rule number one is your teaching. That needs to come first, then uni, and then all the extra bits can come after that. Once you've got those two things nailed, then you can start to focus on the rest of it. I think that's really good advice. You know, having that hierarchy of of your priorities established quite early on. You know, if you've got the the actual fundamentals of your teaching established first, yeah. and then and your assignments for uni, and you know, then and it's great to run a club and that sort of thing as well. But that that's sort of tertiary level almost isn't it with rather than uh being a priority yeah um you know that's really good advice and I, I remember i remember one of the things i found quite early on um last year was that when i came in through my front door at the end of school i, I work wasn't going to happen <laughs> i just had to be honest with myself because I'd, I'd get in through the front door and i'd sit on my sofa and i think oh, i'm just going to take a little break for half an hour or so have a cuppa um you know maybe watch an episode of something and then I'll do some extra work. And and being honest with myself, it wasn't really going to happen. Um, 
and so yeah I, I i did sort of try to sort of pivot more to doing everything that i could in the morning um uh, and he's mentioned this sort of printers and things like that that that's uh yeah having if you've got a class that's imminent and you know you've got a ton of printing to do just before it and there's a big queue that's that's very stressful so yeah yeah, yeah. i mean i mean like... that the whole the whole school environment is stressful and i think this is what I think this is what sometimes PGCE, myself included, mentors, we do sometimes forget it. So like, I remember once I stopped a, a PGC student on the corridor, literally just walking past, I barely slowed down. I was like, oh, by the way, we've got a meeting at, uh, at lunch just for just for five minutes. Uh, and she just fell to pieces. And mm. I was like, uh-oh, I was like, oh no, what's happened? <laughs> um, and it's because she was banking on the entire of lunch to get these like listed jobs done. And obviously, of course, I was like, oh, well, don't come to the meeting. It's not that important. And then I took some jobs off her plate, but it's easy to forget how quickly these jobs rack up and things like printing. Um, this is what I can't stress it enough. Um, you know, using your time in the mornings to be effective um, and to get things done. You know, it's you do see teachers who, who, who've, been, who've been in it a long time and we are running between lessons to a printer. But that but that is um it's an earned skill that's because i can teach that lesson really if that printer breaks i can teach it without it you know I, I can teach it with just a pen and a board but when you're still learning you need those resources they're your scaffold they're your support so you know get everything printed i mean i know some teachers who um on a monday morning will come in extra early and print for the whole week like i can't do that because my brain doesn't work my, my, I, I don't plan that far in advance but um you know, I, I know teachers who do that and they've got little Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday drawers and they keep mm. all of their printing. You know, it's all done or they do it Friday after school because that's another great time. It's horrible because it's Friday, but the school will empty out on a Friday after school and you'll have the printer to yourself um, because most teachers won't stay behind on a Friday. Yeah, so, so you've got all the, all the time in the world to do it then, haven't you? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think that just touching on something, something you said as well, I think the biggest one of the big problems with PGCEs is moving from that. A lot of people are moving from either a different job or a student life into then what is quite a stressful career. Um, and they used to being able to go home and have a cup of tea and do nothing. Um, and they think that, oh, I'll just be able to work from home. It's actually quite a skill to be able to work from home. And um, it takes a lot. It takes immense amount of discipline. I'm not very good at it. I can plan planning at home. No problem at all. Cause I really enjoy planning, but marking, them books are sitting in that bag. I'm not going to touch them um, because I don't really want to do it. So it's, mm. I'm just going to put it off. Um, it takes a huge amount of discipline. So I would say to PGC students as well is do not rely on working from home. If in the first week you realise you can't do that, you need to reorganise yourself. Um, it either means staying in school or finding a little nice, a nice little Starbucks or something nearby or finding somewhere else that you can work. Um, and, 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 you know, like I say, organising yourself, box off two hours or something um, and, and do it then. Um, don't just power through thinking you will work from home. If you can't do it in the first week, you won't do it as the weeks go mm. on because you're only going to get more tired as the weeks go on. So that sofa and that cup of tea and that Netflix binge and that Great British Bake Off is only going to start looking more appealing as you get more tired as the term goes on. So, you know, I, I think that we we as mentors need to make sure that our students are honest with themselves and um, that yes you might see teachers leaving school at bang on half three or bang on three o'clock but there's a good chance that they've got a very disciplined routine in place whereas you know if you know you can't do that then don't flog a dead horse you're going to have to stay in school to do your work because you know otherwise as you say it just isn't getting done yeah that, i mean that's something i found quite early and i i did work from home because um i think a lot of people doing their pgc now if they've come from a different career, they might have worked from home over COVID, for example. So they've had that experience. And, and I did too. I worked from home over much of COVID. And um, I did, I, there was aspects of it I liked. And I, I did get myself into a position where I was quite disciplined with it. But of course, that, and, and I had my sort of space compartmentalized quite well. So, you know, my desk was my workstation, but I wasn't going to, um, but I wasn't going to eat at my desk, for example. I was going to eat somewhere else. And I was, certainly not going to work in bed on a laptop or anything like that because i think that's just going to be really awful for your mental health and that sort of thing as well yeah. um but I, f I found certainly when i was going into school that uh and and then sort of coming back home and thinking yes i've got a set of books to mark they're in my rucksack um you know i'm going to do a couple of lessons tonight 
my, my discipline yeah. wasn't there anymore because I was so tired. And it's like you say, you know, that that episode of Bake Off or something like that, it's going to look far more yeah. appealing when you're at that level yeah. of tiredness. And, I, yeah. and it's like you say, there's a big difference between working from home during a, during a pandemic or working from home because it's your job versus going and doing an eight hour day and then trying to come home and work that's that's different so it that doesn't work for me i can't do that so i go to school very early in the morning i get at least an hour and a half in before the day starts and then um i am absolutely ruthless with my ppa this is another piece of advice i, I would give to any student teacher protect it with your life right mm. because they there are so many things that can happen that can take that ppa away from you um, or you know that 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 a lot of time for you to do your assignments, or for you to do this, or if you do that, and there's so many little things like you can get involved with something on the corridor. There's a conversation going on. Somebody asks if you want to go and watch this club or watch this lesson, or you know, and if you've got time, buzz in, do it. If you know you haven't, then you need to guard that with, you know, you need to protect it and make sure that you are utilizing those hours in the day. And um, because the amount of times I have seen student teachers who are the worst thing as well, I've changed timetables because of this, is when too many student teachers have PPA at the same time, because then they just gather around and they're just chatting, which is totally normal. It's what we as teachers do, mm. but it's not making your life any easier because then they have extra hours of work to do at home. In a perfect world, you wouldn't have to work at home, but I'm yet to find somebody on their PGCE who hasn't had to work from home. Um, I, I'm, I'm yet to see it. So I, I won't even... Uh, insult people's intelligence by suggesting you shouldn't have to work at home you are going to have to there's, there's no way but what I did for example wasn't my PGCE year but my NQT year um ECT it's called now um I used to drive home and right near my house there was a Starbucks and I would pull in there and I'd do an hour and a half in the Starbucks uh with a cup of tea and before I got home because I just knew I wouldn't do it at home and um, so even if it has to be something like that you know but yeah it's it, it's a it's a real self-discipline task being able to finish the work but um you know if and as i say this leads back to if you find yourself struggling um, and you are for you know you are sort of getting a bit snowed under definitely don't put your head in the sand definitely speak to somebody tell them that you're struggling um and we can you know we can take loads off people i've done marking i've done parents evenings i've done all sorts of things for pgc students who have just you know the assignments come at just the wrong time and they're just they, you know they need some support we don't expect you to know everything straight away we don't expect you to be able to do it all because you know there's teachers who've been in the game even longer than i have and they can't do it all so we don't expect you to be able to do everything all at once so you know if you do need the help you only need to ask um, yeah, and yeah it's doing it sooner rather than later isn't it and i i think that's the mistake yeah. i made is is I, I st certainly made in the past is is putting my head in, in the sand when things have been got, gotten difficult. That's the phrase you use, and I think it's so true. And it's, it's easy to think if if I just ignore it, if I just turn my head, then it's not going to be a problem. It's just going to go away, and of course it doesn't, and it piles up further and further and further. And it gets to the point where you you get burnt out, and it's and that's not a nice place to be in, and it just saps your enjoyment of actually teaching, which is an enjoyable activity, and we we have our subjects that we like to teach, and that we sh we should be flourishing in it you know it's hard work but we should be enjoying it too yeah and I think that as I think as subject uh, mentors you know as, as PGC student mentors I think we should we should be trying to make sure that we fan that flame of enjoyment and that we are really trying to to help you to help these student teachers feel the passion for the for the job because it's incredible you know that I I'm what am I now going into my eighth year ninth year oh God, i feel old and um, ninth year i think of teaching and i love it still i absolutely love my job i love to teach i love to um plan cool lessons and and do and do interesting things i'm always trying to get, be better and use research and and be a better teacher and get better grades and and push my students to be as you know the, the, the best they, they can and um, but there are other aspects of the job that will eat you up and spit you out um it's so difficult there are some parts that are just you know grim report season grim um you, you know when you have to do loads and loads of behavior management stuff you've got to write up the paperwork and you've got mm. to do this you've got to do that it's grim uh, when you have to stand outside and do duty and it's raining grim you know there's there's loads of bits that 
that are that are tricky but um it's definitely worth it for the teaching because it is so fun and if you're a second if you're a primary school teacher little kiddies are absolutely hilarious and if you're a secondary school teacher there's no one funnier than teenagers um so you know you, you you'll have a great time but as you say you definitely can't ignore it and um i also think it surprises um pgc students sometimes to realize the relationship that we have with the university so if there is issues you know and we can speak to the university on your behalf you know we can get you extensions for assignments we can we can talk to your university mentors as well and um, we can arrange meetings to, to, to sort of look at how we balance things and um you know we only ever want you to succeed so if there is you know if it is all getting piled on if it is just too much then yeah you, you just have to say something early on and um and then, and then we can work with the university to support you and and try and make it a bit more of a reasonable sort of situation because the last thing we want is burnout before you've even qualified because mm. that's crazy yeah and no, i think it's uh you, you sort of mentioned things like reports and the behavior and uh sort of um paperwork and all that sort of thing and it's those are some of the things that's sort of quite easy to procrastinate on i think um i think most pgc students won't write reports um i i, I did do a set of reports um last term at the school i was working at and it was so it was just that that sort of job that I just thought I just don't want to do this. <laughs> and it was on those jobs yeah. I did procrastinate on a while. And it was one of those things I got to a Friday and it was evening and I wanted to go home, but I had to finish the reports. I think I just wish I'd done these earlier. <laughs> Maybe got in early one day and just blitzed them. And um I didn't do that. I wish I had in hindsight. Yeah, I mean one of the one of the ways I've I've learned to get around that, and this doesn't just apply to student teachers, this is apply this applies to ECTs and uh, NQTs as well. But um so as a mentor, I always buddy up. So you've got your official mentor, which in you know in my case is me, um, and then you need to have an unofficial mentor, you need to have your buddy within the department, um, and they should be who you set your benchmark against. So I always pick my most organized, most on track person um, and buddy them with them because they then they're almost like a pace setter for a race. You know, they're, they're going to tell you when you should be starting things, when you should be. And I'll do it as well, but I'll do it in an official thing like an email, which I'll send to the whole department. Whereas this pace setter might say to you, actually, get that, get that started now because it's going to take you ages or oh, actually, do you want to sit with me while I do this? And then you can see how I do it, you know? Um, mm. Definitely, like, like teachers are incredible at streamlining uh, tasks. We are very good at making a task that should take an hour only take half an hour um, because we have so much to do that we can make it fast. Um, so observe them. Don't just observe teachers teaching, but observe them doing their, doing tasks. You know, how do they get through the paperwork mountain? How do they mark? How do they do this? You know, I remember seeing, um, for example, marking tests, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you do not mark it. Well, I do not. And I would never teach anybody to mark a test front to back and then start the next one front to back, next one front to back. That's crazy. Do it a question at a time because then you can learn the mark scheme and you don't have to keep, you don't have to keep looking back at the mark scheme then because then you know what the right answer is. So do it a do it a page or a question at a time. It's all getting ingrained in your head after a while after you've done five or six. That's it. Same, Once you yeah. do five or six, you know the answer, you know the marking points, and then you can just rattle through them and then you go question two and you do all question twos and then question three, all question threes. And you just and work through it like that. That's far quicker than doing full tests, you know? And that's the kind of thing that you wouldn't learn unless you saw another teacher do it. Because it might not be anything you've got any experience of. Um, but I remember seeing a teacher as well. Um, she taught me how to work the printer settings um, so that I could print quicker because they could print in little booklets rather than on full A4 pages and things like that. So when you're observing um, teachers, don't just observe their lessons, but observe how they go day to day. You know, observe um, what they are doing and, and how they get through these tasks. You know, if you are invited to take part in reports, for example, ask to observe them. Go and say, can I sit with you while you write these reports? Because the teachers have inc an incredible knack at making a very difficult job more simple. There'll be little, there'll be little um, cut throughs and, and workarounds that make it easier. And so, um, definitely make use of the other teachers in the department and um, and find out their sort of tips and tricks and make those things quicker. Because there will be ways to make them quicker, even if no one's told you about them.
That's a really good tip. And I think, you know, student teachers, probably in the first couple of weeks, they'll spend probably most of it observing other teachers teach within their department in secondary, but also um, in other departments as well. And that's a really valuable thing. And I think everyone understands that. But actually, observing someone doing a task, so actually maybe saying to your mentor or somebody else who you see as a really good teacher, saying, could I just watch you plan a lesson in real time? Sort of thing. No, what, what, are, what are you doing? Or uh, you know, mark mark a set of books or something like that, that and or just to, just do a set of printing, like you say, looking at the printer settings. They can be a bit bewildering if you've never Hon- used one of those big printers before. <laughs> Honestly, hmm. I didn't even say it then, but but your mention then of watching a teacher plan lessons. I remember finding out that one of my student teachers was taking over an hour to plan a lesson, and and I ended up asking, you know, if if any subject mentors end up listening to this watch we should be watching you plan a lesson because you know it takes me all of about probably telling on myself here but all of about six minutes to plan a lesson six oh. minutes to plan <laughs> the bare bones of a lesson and um, and then you know resource finding and stuff like that maybe another 10 minutes i can get a day's worth of lessons done in three hours if that if that to be honest it would actually i could probably do a week in an afternoon um, because, you know, and because you've got this like bank, because you've got your banks of resources and most schools, and I know that some PGCEs are very funny and they're like, oh, make your own resources and stuff. Meh. You can scaffold off somebody else's. You don't need to make it from scratch. That's silly. Mm. But, um, you know, make it your own. Just put your name on top of it or something, but it's fine. Um, and, but yeah, I remember watching, watching the student plan the lesson. And, you know, I think the reality is that often you're so worried about the fine details but actually you know it, it's that again talking about sustainability that's not sustainable an hour per lesson when you when you are going to have to teach you know t- 25 lessons a week when you're a full-time teacher taking an hour a lesson is not sustainable that's that's crazy so you know as much as like definitely watch watch another teacher plan a lesson watch and your mentor plan a lesson. And if you think that yours is taking you too long, ask them to watch you, because I do it now. Now it's part of my standard practice with ECTs that come in. And like I say, I've got I've got two ECTs this year and a PGC student. And one of the first things I will do this week is I will watch them plan a lesson. And then I can help them. I can be like, mm, you said, like that doesn't need to be that detailed or that doesn't need to be that, that busy. It's different with the PGCE because of the amount of paperwork you have to fill out, which is another rant. But, um, you know, it, the actual cognitive process of planning a lesson should not be taking you an hour. Um, mm. And and if it is, you need to speak and get, be like, okay, what am I doing here that's, that's taking so long, really? Because that's just a time eater, isn't it? Absolutely. And I, I think it's really, I'd like to talk more about lesson planning in just a moment. I'm just going to take a short... Um, Pause now where we hear from our sponsors. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. Thank you. So yeah, you know, we're talking about um, planning lessons and you observing your trainees, uh, whether ECTs or PGC students plan a lesson. That's something I've never experienced, but it's just got me thinking. That's definitely something I'm going to ask my mentor to do this year. Is 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 can you watch me plan a lesson? Because my my school, um, as I found out yesterday, they they've got a big bank of lessons. Yeah, they're, all, they're very organised. They actually do all their printing on their inset days. So on Monday when they come in, they'll be printing all their resources off for the entire no, it's the entire year or the entire term. No, but they're very organized like that. But the expectation on me as a PGCE student is I will need to be doing my own planning too. Um and so yeah, I'd absolutely love to have somebody just watch me do it. And um, you know, you talk about that um 
PGC student you had once that took over an hour and, and that's definitely been me at times um taking a really long time to do it because it's a little bit perfectionist tendencies I think I've got sometimes is you can get really hyper focused on details and for me it's like with the PowerPoint making sure everything's lined up really neatly and it all comes in on when you want it to and you think nobody cares really at the end of the day it's not a it's not the priority it shouldn't be the focus and it just eats up time and it, it's just yeah. yeah 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 this this perfectionist thing is a thing we see hugely in in student teachers and um i call it the miss honey effect um it's wanting to be like miss honey off matilda you know that perfect kind yeah. of uh, kind of teacher and, and, and have everything ready um I so my department is the same as, as the one you've just described so we do all of our printing and and we do uh, evidence organized and we print all our tests off and stuff because we all do tests at the same time and uh, th there's no obligation on individual teachers to print unless there's something unique that you want to do um, which again is totally fine um but uh, you know going on to powerpoints and stuff like that I think that what can happen with student teachers sometimes is and this is where the paperwork bit winds me up because the paperwork bit um, really, the only bit that you need to, that you should know is what do I want my students to learn? How are they going to learn that? Uh, and how am I going to, how do I know they've learned it by the end of the lesson? That's it. That's, yeah. all, that's all you need to know. Um, you don't need to uh, know, you know, it shouldn't be a case of hours and hours of tarting up PowerPoints and worksheets and everything else for something that you should be able to do with a board and a pen. Because essentially, you're, you know, you're targeting something that lesson, you need to come up with an idea of how you're going to teach it. Is it going to be teacher led? Is it going to be pupil led? Is it going to be group work? You know, how are you going to get them to do it? Um, and then, and then how are you going to assess them for that during the lesson? How are you going to check that, they, that they've learned anything? That's the bare bones of it. So those three things is, is my planning. That's it. So if you open my diary on a daily basis, you will see, for example, year eight, cells worksheet plus teacher uh mini quiz that's what you'll see that's it mm. um because that, that that that's my planning um you know there are some people who are unfortunate when they go to schools and the resources are not there um and they are unable to to sort of access the sort of shared resources um which is very difficult that really is that really is hard work but again buddy up with with your other teachers be nice bring cake or biscuits and they'll share theirs with you because um i guarantee they've got them they're not all making them from scratch every day and um, mm. it's just that they're not a shared department thing so other people will have them um tez is good but be wary of tez because um some of the stuff on there is a bit wild and some of it's stolen and some of it um some of it just isn't as good as it, as it looks it looks very pretty but actually educational wise it's not that good and um, Tez is good, but it can take some time to scour it to really find um, effective stuff. Um, and again, side note for then job interviews later on, we can tell when you've pulled it off Tez um, yeah. in an interview. I, I know straight away when somebody's took it off Tez. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've just, sorry, I've just seen the comment, Tez is the world <laughs> west of educational resources. And um, honestly, I, I can't agree more. I really... I, I really do have a bit of a bugbear with Tez and uh, Twinkle, but um, I do. I think that you know. But I remember being a PGC student, and I remember how hard it is, and going on Tez and trying to find things. And but you know, ask within your department because because they will have it. You know, people will have things for you. They they have to they have to have it because they taught it before. So um, yeah, you make use of those around you. Definitely don't try and go it alone. Um, because if you try and make every single resource for the year, you are going to have a really hard time. You just, you, it's gonna, it's just gonna eat up all your time. Yeah, it's just, it's unsustainable, isn't it? And I think, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, be, being nice to people and just asking, oh, but, you know, perhaps you've uh, could share a particular lesson that you did or something like that with the, um, with me or something like that, and just being polite and friendly is that they, they feel like, you know, oh. Want to, they want to help you out, which I think most most teachers do. They do want to help each other out. And I, I think one of the things I found um, really helped me was again last term when I was working um, as a mainly as a cover teacher, and I had my own timetable, but I was also covering lessons just when and as they asked me. And it really did force me to become fast uh, with doing things because quite often I'd be given no notice to go and teach a lesson, 
and I'd be in the classroom and I'd have very little planned. So I might have, and it's sort of, sort of one of those things where during, while taking the register, I'd just sort of be mentally planning the lesson in my head. And actually there's a lot you can just do with a board and a pen. You don't need a fancy PowerPoint to do it with. And it, it really did make me fast adapting um, to teaching a lesson, you know, lots of subjects, because um, that's just what you had to do. <laughs> I was doing work yeah. as a cover teacher and it was, it may be good at modeling, yeah. I think, which was really a good skill to develop. So were you asked to cover while you were doing your PGCA? No, this was um, this no. was last term. So I was on my my break for my PGCE. Um, right. So no, no, I wasn't doing any covering during my PGCE. Um, no. Thankfully, because that had just been ridiculous. No, yeah. no. So this this was when I I had a job and I was working and um, um, yeah. So I, I wasn't supervised in lessons with a mentor like a PGCE yeah. student was. But you know, you ju it just it was a sort of school where it was chronically understaffed and. We just would say yeah. they'd say, "Oh, we need someone to teach that lesson." You think, "Well, I've got five minutes um, to plan it." Right? Okay, off we go. You know, you, you do get faster to it, and it, 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 but it is a skill that you have to develop, isn't it? And it's, um, yeah, so again, like yeah, you say, I think other people do it. I definitely think, um, I definitely think that this is where this idea of like um, teaching being like an art form type thing comes from. And I think because I'm a scientist, my brain doesn't like that very much. But teaching is definitely, it's a skill. Um, and like any skill, you have to practice um, and you have to hone that skill. I think that some ECTs um, and, and PGC students, they come into it and they feel like they should be really good straight away. And I just, you know, I always ask them, what makes you think that? Like, what makes you think that you should be able to, why would you think you could pick up a violin that you've never played and play it? You know, it's it's a mm. skill. Like you have to learn. Like, and, and our job is to teach you. Um, and I, as you say, you know, eventually you get to the point where, yeah, I, I can. I mean, I've done it countless times where I've rocked up expecting year nine. I've got my days wrong. Year eleven is standing at the door. I haven't planned the year eleven lesson, um, and I'm having to wing it. Um, you know, it's not something I like doing on a regular basis, but it is something I'm capable of doing. Um, and I think that you know that is quite a um, it is quite an important skill to have because you will have timetable mess ups when you think you're on a different day. You know, we've all thought it was Friday and it's not, it's Thursday and you've forgotten that you've got a different class and or uh, the fire alarm's gone off. Um, and so, you know, the lesson that you were going to do, you can't do now because you've only got half the amount of time. So what are you going to do? You're not going to try and squeeze the full hour into half an hour. So now you have to, you know, it's about being flexible. And I think that, again, that comes from practice and it comes from being organised. Um, you subject knowledge comes into this as well, which I hope you don't mind me uh, mentioning this. But um, PGC students can be um, a little bit um, overconfident with their subject knowledge um, and not very willing to sort of say anything about it. Um, nobody expects you to know the entire GCSE curriculum or the entire sort of biology curriculum or chemistry or geography or you know you're not going to be an expert at everything so some of your at home work might actually be teaching yourself because a mm. lot of the lack a lot of the lack of confidence that you see in this reliance on powerpoints and reliance on worksheets comes from a lack of subject knowledge it so comes from it comes the fact, up a crutch doesn't it then for yeah it comes from the fact that knowing. they don't really that they can't really explain it offhand they can't just go with it with a pen because they don't really know what they're talking about so sometimes it can be a case of taking a step back from everything else from all the pedagogy from all the educational research from everything and just going okay do i actually need to just take maybe an hour and just go over the bbc bite size page myself or go over the textbook myself and just make sure that i know this off by heart so that so that when you then come up in front of the kids and you're always going to have some weird kid ask you some obscure question that you don't know the answer to <laughs> that's fine like that always happens but you know, just so long as when they're asking you sort of simple questions, you do know the answer. And it might be that you have the textbook open on the desk or something just for like, or you make yourself like a little page of crib notes for the lesson or something. But kids can sniff it out. They know when you don't know what you're talking about. And if you don't, that complete, and then if you don't feel like you're confident in what you're talking about, then that undermines your own confidence and then you get all flustered and then you press the wrong thing on the keyboard. Now the PowerPoint's gone. Now you've knocked your coffee over. Like that's where it all, all of yeah. that anxiety comes from, just that foundation confidence. Whereas now, I mean, you know, when, when I first started teaching, 
Um, I hadn't done plants since I was at school because I did uh, evolutionary genetics at uni. So I hadn't done plants since I was at school. And I was constantly mixing up the xylem and the phloem and the leaves. And I was, ah, uh, and I hated teaching it because I didn't know what I was talking about. And I knew the kids thought I was rubbish. Yeah. Whereas, whereas, and it was my PGCE mentor that said to me, when you teach something you know, you're a different teacher to when you teach something you don't know. Like, and you can spot it and the kids can, and that's why you've got better relationship with one class than the other. Because with one class, you're super confident, breezy, light, everything's fine. And with another class, I was a nervous wreck because I didn't know what I was talking about. So I think it's really, yeah. Yeah, go on. Sorry. I, think, also, I was just saying, it's, it's, I just had a comment here saying it's a huge problem with history trainees when they specialize at university and then they have to become a generalist. And it's, and I think that's true of a lot of subjects. I mean, if you're teaching science and you've got a biology degree, but you've got to teach a bit of GCSE physics, that that's going to be tough. Or um, my, my degree is in um, geology and marine biology. So, and I'm teaching geography and that means all of the human geography side of things I've not studied at, at degree level. I, I did a level geography, but that was a long time ago now. And you know, that's a lot, that stuff sort of leaked out of my brain and that uh, it's, I've had to do a lot of, um, I've had to do a lot of preparation and revision myself um, for some subjects. And it, and, but it is, as you say, I have gone into some lessons and I do remember um, teaching a module on glaciers, which, it's something I don't think I've ever studied at all at any level of my own education. I've got to teach glaciers at GCSE level. And, and you know, admittedly, I went into the lesson. I thought, I don't fully understand this. I can't remember which which um, feature go, is which keyword. And, and it, like you say, you get the kid who asks a difficult question. And you think, oh, I don't know the answer to that. And it, it, it's, it does unravel quite quickly. You do get flustered and stuff goes wrong. And, yeah, so absolutely, I think being really firm in your subject knowledge but also knowing you can't be expected to know absolutely everything all at once. You know, you might, you might have done AQA, but now your school does OCR or something like that, and they've got different syllabi. And, yeah, it, yeah. it, it is difficult. And it, taking that time to actually just be confident in your subject knowledge is, it, yeah, it is a I simple would, thing you can do, isn't it? Just to, Yeah, if, it, if, an yeah. ECC, if, if an, um, a PDC student came to me and said, what's the one thing that I could do that would improve my teaching? I would, I would tell them it's their subject knowledge. Um, because it's being able to talk about it in a way that is a engaging, you know, if you know what you're talking about, the kids are with you, they're listening. You know, if you're stuttering over your words and you don't know what's going on and you're having to keep looking at the PowerPoint, you're going to lose them. If you're nice and confident and you know what you're talking about. Um, so, you know, maybe your lesson planning needs to look like that. Maybe actually we need to half the time we're spending on our lesson plan and the half and the extra half, we need to spend doing a bit of subject knowledge, a bit of reading, watching the odd YouTube video, things like that. Um, you know, and keep it in mind, it happens to us all. Um, last year, I randomly got given an A-level chemistry class and I freaked out because that mm. is not my uh, area of expertise. Um, and I was every night, you know, and this is years down the line in my career. I've been in leadership for a long time. I was sitting with the textbook, making my own notes, putting little post-it notes on the page with like key facts, key things to make sure I've told them, you know, things like that. And it took a lot of extra work. So, you know, make sure that you, you are, that your subject knowledge is sound and it doesn't have to be for the entire spec, but, but for PGCE students, you know what you're going to be teaching because they normally give you a topic, don't they? They normally give you a yeah. chunk to teach. So make sure that you have nailed that topic. You know exactly what is coming up. And don't freak out when the weird kid asks you a weird question because they always do. Um, and it won't be a normal question. It will be something really obscure that hardly anyone knows. Um, and don't be afraid to be like, uh, if we get five minutes at the end, we'll Google it because I don't know, you know, and just move on. Um, don't don't worry about it. You know, I have kids ask me questions now and I'm like, not a clue. Moving on anyway. Yeah. And, I, and I carry on. Really easy to get sidetracked, isn't it? Go on a it's super tantrum. easy to get sidetracked. Yeah. And, and and also make it super easy to let it make you feel like, oh, I should know that. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't know that. Sometimes the questions aren't weird. Sometimes the kids are just asking you something that's really obscure and that's okay to just move on. Um, but yeah, subject knowledge is a huge one. And um, as I say as well, like your lesson plan will get better. As your subject knowledge gets better, you're less bothered about your worksheets and stuff because, because you can 
come up with on the fly sort of activities for them to do you know which bits they need to write down you know you know making little store like for example using that uh, comment like um with the normans or whatever if you know the normans super well just disclaimer i do not um but if you do you know then you'll know the key bits that they need to know and so you can get them to do activities based off of those key bits and uh, with glaciers you, you know you'll know that and so you'll be able to be like, okay, so what, what we need to do is we need to target this particular bit because this is the tricky part. You don't know that if you've not read through it yourself. Hmm. I, so I can it, imagine it like, more sympathy for um, primary uh, school teachers in particular who, you know, they've got to teach everything. <laughs> it's just, you know, they, they may... I don't know how not... they do that. No, it is. Uh, no, I was a TA in primary for a while and I remember just having to sort of TA um, doing sort of, sort of maths interventions with year sixes and no, I think I can do maths just fine. You know, I can, my maths skills are all right. You think, actually, I haven't studied this level, this sort of maths for, for you know, 20 years at this point. I've never, I haven't had to multiply fractions. And it's all of a sudden I think, oh, I've got to remember how to do that. And I've completely forgotten. Um, yeah, and it's, it's yeah, yeah, and it, that that's a big challenge, I guess, all, all subjects. And I just a lot of sympathy for primary teachers in particular about that. But no, it's good advice. Just absolutely being confident in your subject knowledge. and. Um, yeah, be, you, you know ahead of time what you've got to teach, don't you? So you, you've got that time to refresh and watch a bit of YouTube. Or actually, I found the Twitter community, at least in geography, is is they're really generous in sharing their knowledge. So if you've got yeah. a question um, or you're in desperate need of a resource because you have no idea how to teach a particular topic, and it's not to say ask constantly because that's you know to exploit people, but you know you can politely ask every now and again. Oh, somebody got any ideas for this? Or um, Got a I think the key thing to remember, effective. the key thing to remember with that is that we've all been there, we've all done it. So we all know how hard it is to be a new teacher starting out and just not, you know, and you're drowning in paperwork and university paperwork and everything else and essays and trying to learn what the, you know, what the procedure is for this and that. And so, you know, I know for I know for a fact if anyone ever asks on Twitter for anything that I know I've got. I'm so happy to give it over because it's, you know, if I can stop them having to do what I had to do and make it from scratch, well, then that's, I'm buzzing, you know? Mm. So um, definitely ask, definitely go out on Twitter and be like, has anybody got any idea about this or any resources? And and, and even now I do it sometimes um, more now with like data analysis, because some people are amazing with their ICT and they'll make these mad little spreadsheets that I can use and, and you know, um, so things like that it's use your community around you um because mm. everyone's been there we've done it before we can help um and that goes for um it goes for all subjects primary as well um and there, there will be people out there that that, that that can help you and twitter is really useful for that um it's a it's a it's an underutilized resource i think for a lot of people because it it really can um save you an awful lot of time save you a lot of worry as well because you know, if you put something out that's happened, you know, you see it quite a lot. If you are present on the teacher Twitter community, people will be like, oh, this happened to me today and I don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden there's 50 other teachers going, oh, that happened to me five years ago or four years ago. And this is what I did. And this is what we did. And blah, blah, blah. You know, and it, it can put some things at ease a little bit. Um, it's and it's, it's a really good place to get support and, you know, to get that sort of community feel. Um, it is useful. Yeah, absolutely. One, one, actually, one of the things they suggested to us in pretty much our first session at university last year was get yourself a twitter account even if you don't um actively post on it or anything even just using it to follow other people who are in your mm. um in your subject or in, within the same sort of niche that you're in yeah. and just seeing what they they're putting out and what they're sharing is really useful um i suppose it does segue into a, a really important topic that i know a lot of people will be thinking about and that is social media and being a teacher um oh i'm ready that, that's that's an yeah. absolute minefield isn't it because you know twitter is public instagram is public facebook is public um you know we, there are settings and things that you can use but what what is sort of your main sort of guidelines for that okay you need to disappear you need to disappear off off of social media um you need to uh if i if, if i was a new this is what i did when i started and any advice i would give is uh get rid of any old social media um accounts or change the name to something that the students can't find they will look for you 
They will look for you on everything possible. I've had students find me on my Xbox account. I've had students find me on Pinterest. Um, I don't know why they would want to see what kitchen colours I was looking at, but they do. <laughs> um, I've had students openly admit that they've looked for me on uh, Instagram, on Twitter, on um, Facebook and things like that. If you are going to have a teacher Twitter, you must remember that that is uh, a professional thing and uh, make sure that in the bio it says that, that your views are your own and do not reflect that of the organization make sure that you don't tweet anything particularly you know crazy try and stay away from religion and politics and, and anything it's hard as a teacher to stay away from politics but try not to try not to um, be too incendiary even with that in the bio because some schools are, are enough and um, when it comes to facebook facebook is the one that has the most problems because instagram and Twitter, most of us got when we were a little bit older. So it's not quite as um, sort of childlike. And, and, you know, we've only posted sort of good things, but lock it all down, make it private, change your name on it to like your middle name or or something that, that that's going to be hard for them to find. Um, and even if they do find it, it's all private, so they can't get on it. Make sure your profile picture is something that's perfectly fine. I've had students... Um, find the Instagram of a, of a colleague that was private, but they've just took the profile picture, blown it up, made it big and printed it off and spread it around school. So if your profile picture's on there, make sure it is something that you don't really care if it gets spread around school, no big deal. Your Facebook is going to be the one that's the problem because you've probably had that since you were quite young, which means there's going to be some really embarrassing stuff on there from a while ago. Um, that needs to be locked down. Get rid of anything on there that you um that you don't want anyone seeing so for example one of the ones that people forget to get rid of is what somebody else has tagged you in and um, so they'll get rid of it off their own but they haven't got rid of it they haven't got rid of the tag so if they search your name you're still tagged in the other person's you know get rid of anything like that uh, my advice would be unless it's incredibly sentimental i would get rid of it entirely um, if it's if it's one you've had since you were a teenager, I would just get rid of it entirely because the kids are like FBI agents. They will find yeah. it, um, and and they will mm. and they and and they will you know they'll look for things. And um, I used to work with a colleague who um, had an old Halloween photo, and the Halloween photo was when was from when she was about eighteen. Um, and in the Halloween photo, uh, she was brandishing like a like a fake knife. Um, a parent found it, made a complaint, uh, and she yeah. did actually, and she did get a verbal warning for it. Um, because in your contract, it states that you must not behave in a manner that brings the school or the organisation into disrepute. Now that is a blanket statement. They can make that mean whatever they want it to mean. So you need to make sure that, as far as a Google search goes, you are squeaky clean. Nothing should come up from your social media. Nothing. Um, and make no mistake, schools do do this. I've done it. Um, when I've recruited, mm. I have looked. You know, I, I've looked for their LinkedIn or I've looked for their, you know, whatever. So make sure that it, you are quite happy. Anything that you um, have on your social media, you are okay with your head teacher seeing because that is the risk you're running with it being on there. That's really um, good advice, I think. Yeah, sorry. You you mentioned um, you know Facebook, and I've, I've I can't remember when I got Facebook. I might have been sixteen or seventeen or something at the time. You know, yeah. And it's got all of my undergraduate nights out photos yeah. and things like that in it. And I I haven't deleted it, but I did change my name on it so to something else, um, yeah. which confused a lot of people who were friends with me on Facebook. But I have yeah. to admit, I didn't um, I didn't think about being tagged in other things that's something i'm actually i'm going to check um straight yeah. after this and double check that and yeah no absolutely um it is a minefield it's a particularly ones that you've had since you were quite young um so maybe not so much yeah the problem yeah. the, the, the problems i've encountered do tend to be more around facebook than the other ones because obviously instagram and twitter and stuff came out a little bit later so um we tended to have been um, a little bit older when when you when you get on that that won't be the case for the future student teachers coming in um so you know it but you really it's it and the thing is i wish i didn't have to say it i wish that it wasn't this way and that we were allowed a bit of privacy and a bit of autonomy in our life but for some reason we are held to a higher standard um than our own prime ministers um 
and that is just but that is the reality of the job and um, you need to make sure that it is completely locked down um, and the other thing i would advise about as well is do not accept friend requests from anyone you don't know because i have had kids make fake profiles as well and try and add me um, and yeah. so make sure that you know you really have got to be militant with your social media you've got to be really sure that that, that they can't find anything um, and there might be some photos on there that are too sentimental to get rid of. Well, then you need to save them onto your phone and get rid of them off the uh, off the platform because, you know, it just isn't worth your job over it. It really isn't. And if it's something that you can't see yourself doing, then you need to question a career because teachers are kept in the spotlight. This It doesn't matter how long you've been in the career. You have got to always be careful of what's on your social media. It is a public job, isn't it, at the end of the day? And yeah. we are working with... Um, yeah, people have from come from lots of different backgrounds who, uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, look, obviously all teachers have their opinions on politics and religion, all these other sensitive issues, but that's something we've got to detach ourselves from when we're actually doing the job. So I think it's really good advice. Um, we're just going to take a quick break now while we hear from our sponsors. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so we've only got a few minutes left now, and it's been really interesting talking to you, Daisy, about all sorts of things, lesson planning, safeguarding, um, all, all sorts of aspects of teaching and social media, of course. So I guess the final thing I really want to ask you about is um, we've talked a lot about the expectations on trainee teachers and how we can do our best in our jobs and our roles and um, come out really good teachers at the end of the course. But what should our expectations of mentors be? What 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 should our relationship be like? Yeah, so that's a that's a really really good question, um, and I think that this can get lost in in when you're training. Um, you know, this is your education. Uh, you are often paying for this. You are, you know, this is, um, it's something that you are that you are absolutely entitled to the full support of your mentor. Um, now you should expect. Um, you should expect a reasonable planning and marking time. You should not be in lessons all day, you know, whether that's observing or whether that's teaching, you, it doesn't matter. You shouldn't be having full days at all. You should be having plenty of time to do your own paperwork. There should be scheduled meetings based off of your timetable, whether or not you're in a fortnightly timetable or a weekly timetable. There should be scheduled meetings with your PGC mentor and your subject mentor. Um, do not let them miss them. And we are busy people and often, you know, things clash. But if we have to, re if they say to you, oh, no, I can't make it today, I've got to do this, make them rearrange. Uh, you are entitled to that time. You're entitled to sit with them and get that support. And um, if, you know, your subject mentor is a very busy person and potentially the head of department and things like that, then ask them to be buddied up with somebody else in the department who's maybe not quite as um, who doesn't have as much sort of time demands that, that you can get support from. Um, in terms of the school, you should be fully, um, what's the word, like initiated within the school. You should know these routines, things like that. If you don't know them, then it is your absolute right to be like, can you run that through again? Or can I have that on paper? Or is there a, is there a handbook I can be given? Or, you know, things like that. Um, you're entitled to know what you're doing. Um, in the very sort of, in the extremes of it, um, do not let them leave you in that classroom alone. Um, we, I've seen uh, PGC mentors do this before, um, where they sort of use it almost like a free lesson. You are not a supply teacher. You are not there to cover their class. Um, they should be engaging with you. They should be giving you appropriate feedback at the end of every lesson. They should be supporting you in your planning and supporting you in 
in the needs of the class if you've got um potentially SEN students or or behavior management issues in the class then, then they should be supporting you with that and um, if you do not feel like you're getting that support again this harks back to something I said earlier and um, the university and the school work very closely together snitch on them dob them into the university mentor and that, and I guarantee the mentor will phone school and will deal with it snitch on them because that it's not right that's your education and it's your career that you're going for and they should be supporting you in that so whatever you know whichever teacher you're you're taking their class you know it is not an opportunity for them to get off and get a cup of coffee and see you in an hour because you're not you know you're not qualified yet you're not insured fully you know you need to be with a qualified member of staff and that is putting you at risk don't let them leave you behind and um, you know make sure that the feedback is comprehensive make sure that you are getting um, that you're learning you should be learning you should feel like every day you're getting a little bit better and you're learning and if you don't feel like that if at any point you feel like you're just being left to sink or swim then you you know dob them in get on the phone to university and snitch on them because that isn't right and it's not going to help you in the long run and it might be that the university say okay we're going to look for a different placement or we're going to do this we're going to do that it, don't panic um, it's what's better for you in the long run because a bad PGCE placement will put you off teaching for life. Um, and it can be incredibly overwhelming if you're not supported properly and you are absolutely entitled to be supported. Um, you know, you're in, you should have a good relationship. I will make a side note here. It is a professional one. So be mindful of how you talk to your PGCE mentors within school because it is a professional relationship. I always say don't put anything in an email that you wouldn't be happy to have read out in a meeting. Um, so make sure it's nice and professional, but it should be a relationship. You shouldn't, you know, you should be able to go to them with any concerns or queries or any or anything you need help with. And they should allocate time to help you. It might not be there or then, because like I say, we're busy people, but they, they should find time to support you. Um, and if and as I say, if you don't feel like you're getting that, if you don't feel like you're learning and and, you know, you are improving, then um, you need to you know, you need to speak up and you need to say something because um, otherwise you are just going to drown. You're going to burn out and, and it's no good for anyone then. Um, so, but yeah, you, you have every right to, to be mentored. You have every yeah. right to have somebody that you feel um, has got your back and is improving you as a teacher. It's good to be sort of professionally assertive about, you know, what, what you want and yeah. what you need as part yeah. of your training. Yeah, you are to yeah, don't 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 make the mistake that just because you're a student, you're not a child, you're an adult. You know, so so you're absolutely entitled to say, listen, you've cancelled the last two meetings. Um just wondering if we can block some time off because I, I I you know I could do with some I could I could use some support uh, in this, this and this. You know, don't don't feel bad for asking them for your time. They signed up for that. They get free time to support you. They get extra freeze to help you. So don't so so you're entitled to use them. Um, you know, there are instances where they can't make a meeting and things like that, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean that that you should just be left to sort of fend for yourself. You shouldn't be. They should be checking in with you on a regular basis. Um, and if they're not, then as I say, you know, you have every right to to to, to ask for support and to, and and to ask for for alternative arrangements, just as any of us would if if, if our line manager was failing us in our career we, we we would ask for alternative you know something else to be done about it it's really that's a really good point and i think um i think you know as as student teachers i think we're we are really conscious that teachers are all really busy people and you know you mentioned earlier that we have our routines and it's really good to have them but it is a profession where you need to be dynamic as well and think on your feet because things do crop up and maybe unexpected things happen and being being mindful of that so actually there may be the occasion where actually something does need to be rescheduled but it's really important that it is rescheduled and yeah um that that time is still made up for at, at another point um not too yeah. far down the line yeah 100 percent. and and the pgce is incredibly stressful but make no mistake this career is amazing being a teacher is i absolutely love it i love my job i, I and i go into school every day and I have a great time with the students. Some areas of it are rubbish, but some areas are absolutely amazing. 
um, you know, when you have your first GCSE class go through results day, there's not a feeling like it. You know, it, it's incredible. Um, but in order to get there, you need to be taught. <laughs> so, um, you know, you're entitled to that teaching. Um, and that person, you know, should have signed up for that and they know what they signed up for. So, as I say, you're not a child, you're entitled to ask for what, what is expected. You know, yeah, I think that's a really good to note ask. to end on, Daisy. That's, that's, you know, you say it, it is it's a tough career, but it is a really rewarding career. And, and actually, the whole point of the PGC is to get the most out of it and, and to actually be well prepared for going into that career and, and flourishing in it and doing really well. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Daisy, for your time um, this afternoon. I've really appreciated talking to you. And I think there's a lot of really good advice in there for trainees. So thank you so much and all the best with you for the rest of your school year. and your Yeah, you too. Good, good, days. Good, look, <laughs> good luck with the rest of your PGCA. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.